Great to be uh, here. So good afternoon to all of you. It's that time of the day when you like to hear stories, right? So I'm going to talk to you about storytelling, but it's a very important uh, aspect of uh, you know, any kind of enterprise that we're talking about here, which is thinking about the big picture. Right? And um, uh, in this session, we're looking at story, uh, storytelling, culture, strategy. Very interestingly, this room is called strategy. And so that's the big thing about this, that many startups fail because they're so focused on the short term that they don't look at the big picture. And suddenly before they raise their head and they're hitting a wall, and before they know it, they're gone, right? So we're going to talk about some of the big pictures. So it's a bit different from what you've been seeing in this, uh, uh, in this conference here, um, in this conclave here. <clears throat> it's nice always for me to be in Bangalore. I'm a Bangalore kid, and I know at my age to be calling myself a kid is a, you know, but you know what I mean. I grew up in Bangalore. It was in Jainagar um, for a long part of my life. I attended college right here at Indian Institute of Science, so it was very nice and nostalgic. I was driving through from the airport uh, to the venue. Um, so it's a very warm feeling here to be in Bangalore. <clears throat> now what I'm going to talk about today is basically about storytelling. And I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories. So the best way to do that is to illustrate it. Right? So what exactly happens with storytelling. Um, one key thing is that when we think about stories, it's very, very human to be engaging in stories. Right, right from when we are children, to when we die, you know, we're exchanging stories. And when you extend the notion of the story, not as being, you know, once upon a time to, you know, and then they lived happily ever after. You know, if you extend it beyond that, you know what happened on the way to my office today? Is a story. Did you know what the boss said to that guy? Is a story, right? So I want you to think about story in a broader sense, okay? not just the fairy tale kind of story, uh, which has a very good beginning and a very good en ending. And if you think about that, storytelling is a very, very natural human act. In fact, some philosophers have called humans the storytelling animal. Right? So now, how do we use that to think about strategy? And it's very kind of funny for me, who's actually an operations management PhD, two master's degrees in artificial intelligence and robotics, and uh, computer science, distributed systems, to now be talking about stories, right? So what is this? I want, you to I want to take you through the transformation which led me to think about this bigger picture. Yeah. <clears throat> so here, when we think about this, I'm going to phase this talk into two different phases. Why stories help build cultures is going to be the first part. And second part is a little bit more programmatic, where I will tell you how to use storytelling to build culture. And it all feels into, you know, the, the abstract for the talk is saying, you know, storytelling, um, the culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's a famous Peter Drucker thing. So I'm going to relate to that in some sense. Okay? So to do this, why stories help build culture? You know, one of the key things to recognize is that every entrepreneur, every firm should have a story. How many here have heard the Nordstrom story? The Nordstrom uh, department store is famous for its what? Customer service, right? So there is a story told that a customer walks in and he says, I want to return these tires. And the customer service re representative takes the tires and says, how much did you pay for them? And he mentions a figure and the customer is given back the money. The punchline here is that Nordstrom doesn't sell tires. Right? So this is a story that Nordstrom uses, and a lot of such stories, to propagate its identity as a fantastic customer service-oriented company. In Nordstrom, they also propagate the story that the Nordstrom employee handbook has how many rules? One rule, be nice to the customer, in whatever way you can. Right? So it's now left to the individual customer service agent or the sales representative there in the store to handle the customer in a way that pleases the customer. So every entrepreneur must have a story. Okay? And there are certain things that stories do. What stories do is create a root identity. Okay? That is, they mark the company as being this or that. That's a key root identity. Second, from that root identity, what they do is they help 
develop the sh and share the mission and the values of the organization. <clears throat> so, for instance, if you want to be an innovative company, you will have a lot of stories about how people in the company have been very innovative. And that actually fosters thinking about innovation, right? And they can, these become models. And stories are very interesting because what happens is when you listen to a story and you repeat it to somebody else, you will always notice that there's a transformation. What you've done is you've absorbed the story and you're retelling the story as if it's your own. And in that process, what has happened is a lot of transformation has happened and the value propagation really happens. So psychologists have analyzed this a lot about how values are propagated through stories. And of course, the biggest values, the system of religion, you will know that every religion uses a lot of stories to propagate the religious values, right? So stories help to display and help, the, uh, help share the mission and values of your organization. And as I said, with the Nordstrom kind of story, it also helps to build a brand. So there is tremendous potential for stories. In fact, so much when you think about culture that Finland, at one point in the 19th century, found that it didn't have a national spirit. So what did it do? It said, oh, we don't have a national epic. So they went around and gathered folk stories from across Finland and formed this national epic called the Kalevala, which now in, uh, unites all of Finland. So Finland says, oh, we have a you know, national epic. And so nationalism and the, a sense of bonding is built through such stories. Okay? So now, to illustrate this, you know, these three things, how stories create root identities, how they help and display, um, uh, how, to, how they help to share mission and values, and how they help to develop a brand, I'm going to use a story that's very close to my heart. Okay? And that is the story of Vivekin, okay? which is my company, a strategy consulting company. I'm going to tell you an origin story here. So Vivekin started, the thought behind Vivekin started in the late 1990s. And we know what was happening in the late 1990s, right? There was a huge thing about the 2K, Y2K stuff. And there was all this electronic commerce boom because the first boom was happening. E-commerce had just become available. So in this, I had just graduated from Wharton. And I started teaching at Purdue University, my first business uh, faculty position. And, the, and then I moved on to Minnesota. But in that time frame, between 1998 and 2002, there's tremendous chaos going on in the internet world, right? And we all know that, that the e-commerce boom happened and then the e-commerce bust happened. <clears throat> and nobody knew which business model would succeed, which business model would fail. So in this, a critical question for me as a business researcher was, how do you make strategy when the world is so turbulent? Strategy and the turbulent world seem oxymoronic. They don't seem to match, right? So how do you make a resilient company? How do you make adaptable companies? This was a key question for me. So this was the question that I started to explore. Now, when you start to explore this, you suddenly start to realize that there are two paradigms for agility. Now we talk a lot about agile, and I'm not talking of software agility, or agile software, but I'm talking of agile companies, companies that are flexible, companies that are dynamic, right? So two paradigms pop up for you. <clears throat> One is, I'm going to tell you two stories now <clears throat> to show these paradigms. How many here have heard the bear and hiker story, the joke? Okay, there were two hikers who were hiking, and there's a grass, you know, big grassy plain, nothing, no hill, no tree in the distance, uh, and suddenly they see a big bear charging toward them. Okay, pretty aggressively it's charging toward them, and these guys see that there's nothing more they can do but run, right? So they start to run, and suddenly one guy stops and pulls off his knapsack and backpack and pulls out his hiking shoes and starts wearing his running shoes. So the other guy says, are you crazy? The bear is running so fast, we, we can't outrun the bear. So this guy turns to him and says, you know, I don't have to outrun the bear, I have to outrun you, right? So this is a short-term kind of thinking that drives most of our business thinking, most of our startups today. Okay? The other paradigm, the second paradigm, is what I call the broken cup. And this is actually a true story. Two researchers uh, who were in Chicago who were interviewing a lady who was in her late 60s and who has been running a very successful restaurant asked her, what's the secret of your success? 
And she thought for a while and she said, you know, actually when you ask that, I have to go back to when I was five years old. Okay. At that time, my mother and I were washing dishes. I was helping my mother wash dishes in the kitchen. And suddenly, a cup fell out of my hand and broke. My mother didn't say a word. She picked up another cup, dropped it on the floor. It too broke. And we silently swept the pieces and threw them away. Now, this becomes a model for her for running a business. What happened here? The idea is that when you start thinking about this, it are things, makes you think about how to handle failure, especially not your failure, but somebody else's failure. How do you tolerate, how do you recover from something that, that you, was not anticipated? So a lot of lessons for this. So this becomes a model. Now, there's a long-termness to this. So this story that she's been telling you is about 60 years old, right? So the long-termness of this is what is one kind of paradigm. So for me, when I started thinking about, you know, how do you create agility without actually forsaking the long term, this model becomes, this story becomes a paradigm for me. Okay? So what happens? When I start to look for a paradigm, I suddenly realize that I've been trained as an electrical engineer, I've been trained as a computer scientist, an artificial intelligence researcher, and then I've moved on to do my PhD in operations management, a quant jock, if you want anybody to be called a quant jock, it's me. Right? And suddenly what's happening is that I'm finding that my economic models are not really doing strategy for me, especially when it comes to dealing with dynamic worlds. So how do I handle this? And suddenly it comes to my mind that what I'm missing in all this is that there is a certain human dimension. So today morning, when if those of you who attended JP's keynote, he's talking about data. And there's a lot of data, but the data has to be interpreted. Who does the interpretation? Machines can't do it. Humans have to do it, which is why the, which is why the role of action comes in. How do you move from data to action, right? So the human dimension is very, very important here. And when you started thinking about this, and suddenly a, a story comes up here. So here's something called the Bering Strait, right? It's a thin strip of sea that divides Alaska from Russia. Okay. Anybody know the significance of this? The first humans crossed over from Europe, which is Russia, into North America. And these people were called the Clovis people. And this happened about 11,000 years ago. Okay. The interesting thing about the Clovis people is that not only did they cross over into North America, but they spread very quickly through North America down to almost New Mexico. And in fact, today, fossilized remains of these you know, Clovis people are available in New Mexico. Now, the interesting thing is, what did these people encounter? So they were the first humans to go into North America. So what did they encounter there? And of course, those of us who have seen Ice Age will recollect that there's this woolly mammoth, you know, lovable woolly, woolly mammoth and a romantic kind of, you know, saber-toothed tiger. But these are the big animals that they uh, encountered there. So woolly mammoths and giant bisons that they had to hunt for food. Huge animals, and these people are more or less like you and me, right? So puny animal, puny people against these huge animals. Not only that, the saber-toothed tiger, very, very ferocious animal, right? It, had, it was about one and a half times today's tiger size, very powerful forearms, two nine-inch long stiletto-like knives. So you would be trapped by, this, by the forearms, and the, the, the tiger would go directly for your jugular. So, you know, my theory is that if you were caught by um, a saber-toothed tiger, Death was instant but painless, right? So, or you can flip it around, death was painless but instant, right? So this is the kind of thing. So now you flash forward 10,000 years. There are no woolly mammoths, there are no saber-toothed tigers, but there are people. And so paleontologists today believe that what explains this is that there is a certain thing called human intelligence, right? Um, so intelligence allows these Clovis people to design spearheads in a very, very, you know, very innovative way where they have a sharp edge, but it also has a fluting, which makes it much more aerodynamic. They learn to hunt in teams. They learn to do a lot of teamwork. So there is a lot of stuff that goes on which is credited, credited to human intelligence. And so I, that's how I started to think about, can we think about human intelligence as being a, 
you know, model for us to think about strategy in a very dynamic world. Okay? So the intelligence the, the definition today is very interesting by psychologists. It says it's the ability to adapt to an environment, ability to reshape, or the ability to reshape an environment, or the ability to choose a new environment. And it, the intelligence allows you to do any of these three depending on context. Okay, so it's a meta capability in some sense. <clears throat> now, very interestingly, this maps to very um, you know, well-known theories in management. Um, for instance, adapting to an environment is basically when you have forces out there in the environment and Porter tells us how to adapt to that. Reshaping is nothing but using your core competence to reshape the environment. And choosing a new environment is the new thing in strategy, which is blue ocean, right? So now you say, oh, let, let this thing is not working. This competitive landscape is not working for us, so let's find a very new landscape, and that's blue ocean, okay? So this is the you know, theory of human intelligence. Now, but when I start plugging it in and go into psychology, actually I find that there is not one intelligence, but five different intelligences. And that leads to a very new paradigm shifting thinking about agility. Companies are not just agile, but they're agile in five dimensions. So you can actually be agile in one dimension, and if the other dimension is called for and you don't have that agility, you can fail. And there are brilliant stories in that. For instance, Nokia is a classic case of how it had tremendous operational agility, but failed because it didn't have the communicative agility to sense the market. It didn't have the you know, ability to actually do innovation within the uh, industry, in, within the firm, et cetera. So the five intelligences are basically very quickly analytical intelligence, the ability to analyze new, in new ways, uh, operational intelligence, the ability to handle uncertainty with, um, with operations, Inventive, wherever you're trying to do creative stuff, creative solutions. Communicative, where you have to persuade and motivate. That's where the storytelling comes in. And visionary, which is the most important thing, which is where you're actually starting to think of the long term. So if you think about the other four, they're giving you the short term metrics. But what visionary does is says, does it work in the long term? What about the width of scope? How many people are being affected by this? And those of you who have done anything in optimization will know that there's a difference between local optimization and global optimization. So what visionary does is pushes you toward thinking about the global optimization. And there are, you know, I have a book there which goes into all this, so I won't tell you this. But basically, I'm using this as a storytelling model. Okay? So intelligence is in action. Let me tell you how this works in action. Okay? Back in 87, Merck the big pharmaceutical company, found itself in a very, very happy position. At this time, Roy Vagalos was the CEO of Merck, and the African world continent was being ravaged by a strange epidemic. Okay? This was called river blindness. And what would happen in river blindness is that children would be born normally with normal eyesight, but by the time they reached their teens, their eyesight would begin to fail, and by the time they were young adults, they were completely blind. So you had these communities of blind people. And everybody in the world was trying to struggle to find some kind of you know, explanation, some kind of solution for this. And suddenly in 87, Roy Vagalos' discovery team comes to him and says, you know, we have a miracle cure. And not only do we have a cure for this, but the cost to commercialize the drug is only $2 million. The cost to produce and distribute the drug is only $20 million. This is pittance for a pharmaceutical company. So here's a gold mine for Merck to exploit. There's a community that desperately needs the medicine. We have a solution, and it's a very low-cost solution, so we can actually get a huge margin by selling this in Africa. Does it work out that way? No, because the problem is that the communities that need this can't afford it. So then, now, this, now you see that the problem is actually changing. So how do it, now, till now it was an inventive, innovative kind of problem. Now the problem comes, how do we get this machine, these drugs across to the people? Okay. So one of the first things that Vagalos does is go to the US government, and the US government, USAID, says no funds, typical answer. He goes to WHO, and WHO says, the World Health Organization also says no funds, but it also says, you know what, you're a rich, fat American company, and these are poor, dying Africans. You have to give this drug away for free. Very true. Roy Vagalos agrees with that. But how do you implement that in a 
that particular solution in a corporate setting, when you're answerable to the board of directors, when you're answerable to shareholders. So how does he convince it? Convince the board? He goes back in corporate history to Japan. In 1945, soon after the war, Merck went to Japan in the reconstruction and gave away tetramycin for free. And as a result, what happened? 10 years down the road, when Japan had forbidden all foreign companies from bidding for government contracts, Merck was the only one that was allowed to bid and win a multi-million dollar contract. So he used that as an example and went back and convinced the board, and the board said, you know, okay, that's fine. And so Merck gave away you know, the drug for free in Africa. Now, this is an illustrative story of how one uses the five intelligences. It starts out as being an inventive intelligence, then it starts out as being a communicative intelligence, and then it goes on to the ethical intelligence, because you're now thinking of the visionary picture of the largeness, the goodness of the world, and then it says, oh, we have to go back to something in history that is analysis, and so you pull out analytical intelligence. So you see that the same problem as you apply these intelligences start to get transformed. Okay? Now, why do I use this solution? <clears throat> okay, so here's what we do actually. What we do is within people and within the organization processes, et cetera, we can actually have a metric and we build, use that metric to assess organization's agilities in five dimensions and recommend solutions. That's our strategy. <clears throat> and of course, this is a new book that's come out from Random House, my book, uh, which talks about all this stuff. Okay. But that aside, <clears throat> what I've done here is I've used my company as an illustration. So there was an origin story, right? Where I said, why did we think about, you know, building this kind of agility with a long-term perspective? So the broken cup story came up there. Then I told you a core story which linked me to intelligences as being a way to think about strategy. Okay? And that's the Clovis people. Then I told you an application story, Merck. Okay? So now you see that there's a game plan here, right? For every startup, you can actually start thinking about why did we start up? So you have to have that root identity established so that everybody in the company knows why this startup exists. Okay? Second, you need to have a core story. What is the process? What is the operational story that's going on there? What drives this particular thing that's going on? And then an application story. Oh, well, if somebody uses this particular product or somebody uses this particular service that you're providing, how would that affect? So these are three different things um, that go on. So what, what storytelling does really is it establishes the core identity, it helps build values and ethos, and it brands the company. Okay? Now, let's talk about some of the methodology. How do you use storytelling to build a company culture? Okay? Well, you have to first pick the stories. So what is your origin and motivating story? Go back to the drawing board, think about why, why did you get inspired? A lot of people today, a lot of startups start up because they're seeing some fad. That's not an answer. Those companies will not survive. Unless there is some growing deep passion that drives this thing, you, know, you, you won't have the company be thriving. So you need to find that origin or motivating story and spread it among your founders and spread it among your first employees and make sure that it spreads to every employee who comes into the company so that every employee knows why this company exists. Okay. Second, what is your operational story? Okay. okay, fine. This is why you came in. What did you do? What is the story that illustrates what you do? You know? So that's the operational story. And third is an application story. Okay, somebody used your product and something dramatic happened. So that builds the branding part of it. So these are the three uh, different things that you would do. So three different kinds of stories you need to pick. Second, you need to create a story sharing environment. Now, I want to talk a little bit about story sharing versus storytelling. Lots of people, you know, when we talk about storytelling, say, oh, we don't have a storytelling culture. People are not very communicative in this organization. But people talk in your organization. It's not as if they come and sit at their desks from morning till night talking to nobody but their computer and go back. People talk to each other, right? So the notion of story sharing is that you expand the thinking about what is a story from being this once upon a time to happily ever after, break that and say, what happened on my way to work today? Did you know what the boss said to the other guy? You know, these kinds of things are stories. Now, create and seed stories so that these are shared. 
So for instance, somebody is doing something wrong, you know what, when for the founder was in a very tough situation many years ago, that's the story that we have in the, percolating in the company. When the founder was in a very tough situation and had to make a choice between paying a bribe and losing a contract, he chose not to bribe. That becomes a model story for somebody right now. Right? So that kind of stuff is what you need to have for story sharing. They're not creating the story, they're not, they're, but they're sharing the story. Yeah? And technology is tremendously beneficial in this. See, uh, those of you who've done anything in knowledge management will know that there are two kinds of knowledge in any company. Right? There's the explicit knowledge, which is coded in, in handbooks, employee handbooks, policy, you know, BOP, whatever you have, business operating procedures and things like that. And there's the tacit knowledge, which is there in the company, right? Which, which is really where the culture comes in. That there's a style, you know, there's, this is not the way of doing things in this organization, or this is the way we do things in this organization. That's the tacit knowledge. And stories are tremendously useful in that. So using technology to drive that is actually a very, very um, useful thing. Yeah? Um, we all know about network effects. And of course, what um, you know, VCs would call this is viral marketing. Right? So viral marketing, viral effects, after hard, hotmail.com took off, this word got coined in marketing literature for, for viral marketing. And we know it in computer science and graph theory as network effects, where the benefits of each additional person to a network actually ex increases the ne network's uh, benefits exponentially. Right? We know that. So in order of n squared, if it's Metcalfe's law, then there's Reed's law, which is saying that if you take social networks into consideration, it actually goes much more exponential. It's not n squared, but it is 2 to the power of n, which is tremendously explosive. Right? So if you use this network effects, which is what stories are, the way they, they spread in a company, seed your story selectively. So you don't have to go around and tell everybody in the company stories. You pick the you guys who will tell the stories. And I'll give you a very quick illustration. This is a psychology experiment here. Um, so here's a network where the orange people have a certain kind of opinion and the blue people have a certain kind of opinion. Okay. So if there was a vote here, who would win? Orange. The orange, right? Because they're larger in number. But if I tell you, that every person votes based on what their friends are saying. So the connections are the friends. Okay. So if everybody tells you what their friends uh, votes based on what their connections are telling you, then the story is very different. So this is one person, orange person. Three fourths or hundred percent of his network is telling him, you know, telling them. Sorry, where is this? This is the orange network. So this orange person. 100% of his friends are telling him that he's, you know, he's wrong. So he votes this way. So this is the kind of thing that happens. So you will see that as you race through this and you see what the orange dots are. So this orange also has 100%. This orange has 75% uh, of his friends telling. So this kind of stuff, if you put that into a table, here's what comes up. That if I let my friends influence me, the blues outnumber the orange. Right? So what happens here is that if I pick the right blues in my network and I plant my stories to the right blues, I have a very effective way of spreading the, you know, the stories in the organization. So this is a, a very nice illustration of how you would very cost effectively, instead of doing this you know, blast of story across the organization, you can do this in a very selective manner. Um, the conclusion, so as I now Rajneesh and I will have a, a discussion, and then you will also be able to ans ask questions. But the conclusion is basically this. Storytelling helps our company by creating identity, sharing values, and creating a brand. And the steps involved in storytelling, are picking the right stories, creating a story sharing environment, and promoting the stories effectively. Okay? So this is a very small gist of, um, you know, of and I used my company's story as an example to illustrate how this can be done. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Prasad. Sure. Thanks a lot for sharing your experiences with us. How to build a great culture through storytelling. Now I would like to invite Mr. Rajneesh Menon from Microsoft for a quick fireside chat with Mr. Prasad. Um, very 
can, can you guys hear me? Okay, that's good. So that's, that's a great talk, Dr. Baba Prasad. And uh, you know, I, I completely understand the fact that we need culture, and we, as startups start institutionalizing their business, this becomes more critical. You know, how do they ensure that the pillars are reinforced over a longer period of time? Okay. Uh, but, but before I go into the, some core questions on culture itself, let me go on to a different topic altogether. Um, you know, you in one of the articles you 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 wrote about why should startups start watching tragic drama and uh, you know something related to the the, the facets of life around that. Sure. Do you want to explain that and then we'll take it forward from there and and talk out sure. more about the culture aspect? Yeah, this was an article in Founding Fuel, which later appeared in the Mint uh, some month, couple of months ago, where I wrote saying that. Every entrepreneur needs to watch dramatic tragedy. So for things like, for instance, things like King Lear, or you know, any of these uh, tragedy, the big notable tragedies. Why should they do that? Why should, they, you know, why should entrepreneurs watch that? My answer, reasoning is this, that for a long time, you know, for much of the time, we are fixed on a very short-term kind of mentality in, in startups especially. And unless you see the big picture, unless you see the things beyond the company, you will not be able to see what the impact is of what you're doing, what should be the world-changing impact uh, that you should be having. So these come through when the larger lessons of life, as I call them, you know, come through when you watch these uh, tragedies. So they're talking about the, the human condition, really, that, that, that goes beyond just the economics that we're dealing with. And we all know that the best companies deal not with goods, but with emotion, right? Why is there an appeal to go to one particular service or one particular product? Primarily because there is an emotional connect to that. And that emotional connect has to be understood. If we have to understand the human need, then we need to watch tragedy, right? That, that was my uh, take on this. Excellent. Yeah. You know why I said, asked that question is because we are, we are staying in Bangalore. And Bangalore is full of startups with unbridled optimism. Right, <laughs> but sometimes it's it's also Absolutely. very important to kind of rein in the practicality of things. Um, I want to ask you a different question now. And if you look into the the system integrated industry as an example, you know, most of them are kind of quote unquote struggling with the current model of resource augmentations. And I, if I draw parallels to the startup world as well, you'll find the CEO is making all the right noises through storytelling and through other means of uh, institutionalizing whatever he has done to excite the external audiences. Correct. But somewhere where they're failing is that they're not able to kind of garner as much internal support as is required. Now my question is, how do you build the culture of ensuring that there is a lot of internal binding as well to what the CEO is saying externally? So how does that culture get built into it? So you have to be strategic about this. I mean, as founders, this, which is why I said, that you have to pick the stories correctly. Okay. If you pick the stories and seed them correctly, then you will be creating the culture that you want to create. Mm -hmm. For instance, you want a very value-laden culture where you know, innovation is rewarded, honesty is reward rewarded, integrity is rewarded. Then you plant those stories about the founder, founders. right? And you say, they found, like I gave the example, this person found himself in a very tight situation, and he still chose us straight and narrow. Right? And that becomes the model for the entire company. So you have to find those things that create the emotional triggers within the organization. So what's happening with, with the uh, instances that you mentioned is that the market need, the appearance of the what, what you would want to appear to the market dominates what you want to actually feel inside the company. Mm -hmm. And there is a lopsidedness to that, and that's what affects uh, you know, the lack of cohesion within the organization. So you think there's, there's some sort of a specialized team, so champions that they need to kind of start institutionalizing at this point in time, or True. how do you? Yeah. So as I showed the network, some people are more communicative, some people are more effective in telling the stories. So find those people who are connected within the organization and use them to you know, do the storytelling or the story sharing. But you have to be very careful about what stories you want shared. So we, we all know this, uh, you know, the, the statement that Drucker made, uh, and which is very famous. And I think you also alluded to the fact that culture is strategy for breakfast. And we know we know the, the deeper meaning of what what that stands for. Uh, but when you, but still, you can't ignore strategy, you know, because you definitely need some strategy. Although the external ecosystem is at this point in time very dynamic, but you still need to have plans, plan A, plan B, and even in the plan A, how you're going to go about it and stuff like that. I also read in one of your articles you talked about 
doing away with this multi-year plans, you know. Right. And I'm interested to un understand because most startups have this problem. Uh, when they go for raising institutional funding, they're asked about, hey, where's your five-year plan? How does growth look like in, in two years from now? And I know that everybody is, you know, creatively using Excel at this point in time, right? Do you agree to me with, 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 that, with that point? Everybody's trying to do that, but they all know deep down in the heart, I know startups are very honest people. They know, the founders, I know, I know that they're trying to kind of come up with some realistic uh, picture out there. So the question I want to understand is, what do you mean when you say the do away with the five-year plans? What is the real strategy and what is the realistic frequency of a strategy plan that they can put into place? Fantastic question. You know, um, when I say do away with the five-year plan, I basically mean this, and there's a growing uh, understanding that the business plans are junk. Right. Primarily business plans are junk, right? We, we all know that, VCs know that, startups know that, right? So the question is, what do we do if we don't have a five-year plan, right? So strategy, we need strategy, but we need a different kind of thinking about strategy. So what I argue in my book and in my writings is that strategy is no longer a plan of actions for the future. Strategy is a set of capabilities that you will build. What kind of capabilities will you build into your organization? So when you build capabilities into your organization, automatically you create a breadth of what situations they can handle. Right? So you have a guy who can do this and this and this. Now if this happens, he's ready to do that. Right? So can you build those capabilities in the organization? And that's how I go back to the intelligence perspective, that you can actually have five different kinds of agilities that you need to bring into the organization, and not just say, oh, we're flexible, or we're agile. We need to build that. Uh, flexibility in five different dimensions, especially the long term. The visionary intelligence is often neglected. And in fact, in my own model, in my own framework, when I started out, I just had the four uh, intelligences, the operational, analytical, inventive, and communicative. And suddenly, two companies which I was touting as being great uh, companies by my framework fell apart. One was Enron, and the other was Satyam. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Satyam, I had gone there two months before it collapsed and said, you guys are doing great stuff because of my model. You know, my model says that you guys are doing great stuff. You're, a pa you know, you're the guys who are setting the goals for every company. In, in, in fact, they won the Peacock Award for corporate governance. Exactly. And, <laughs> and so then they collapsed. So that led me go back, that made me go back to the drawing board. And I figured out that this visionary intelligence that I'm talking about, which makes you think about the long term and not just the short term, and also think about you know, how wide your impact is. When you throw out somebody, it's not just that person you're throwing out of the company, but what exactly is happening to the wider gamut? You know, what happens to his colleagues? What happens to his families? You know, these are the things that you need to ask about. And very rarely do we get into that mode of thinking. You know? So that, that's something that I need to push. So this strategy just changes pictures. Strategy is no longer a definite set of actions I want to do in X number of years. It becomes, you know, very simple an analogy here is, before, when I wanted to drive from here to Mumbai, I would have an exact road map. But today, I have a direction. I have to go northwest. So that is what strategy is. And that lots of things may happen in the way, but do I have the capabilities to handle whatever happens, as long as I'm headed northwest? Let's get the audience to ask some few questions.